How many people do you know who struggle with their health? Chances are, whether they show it or not, most of the people in your life do. And chances are, you're one of them. Whether you're dealing with anxiety, depression, endometriosis, acne, eczema, autoimmune, thyroid, Lyme, brain fog, fatigue, or any other symptom or condition, you're far from alone. Living with symptoms has become the new normal. So no more guessing games. It's time to get answers. Welcome to the Medical Medium Podcast. I'm Anthony William. Hey everybody, we're talking about eggs and why eaters lose all and don't win anything. I got nothing against eggs, that's not what it is. I'm just the messenger of something no one wants to believe. The truth on how eggs were weaponized and used against us. And when you hear how, you will never look at eggs the same again. The one question all these years everyone who knows me personally has asked me is, what do I know and how much do I know? Give me the scary stuff, A.W. So you guys are my friends. I'm going to fill you in on what I know, on what Spirit of Compassion told me many years ago when I was younger about, guess what, eggs. Like so many secrets of the health industry, you won't find this information out there anywhere else. So let me take you back to the 1920s, to when pathology was expanding. The search for what causes disease truly began. And even though medicine was in its infancy, there was a private group in the pharmaceutical and medical world that no one was aware of. It involved investors and interests and a think tank, and they were focused on something that would lead us to how sick we are today and why we are getting sicker than ever before. This mysterious group of people were learning about bugs, not the ones that fly around like zzzz and, you know, and other little insect sounds and everything else, not the mosquitoes, not those kind of bugs. They were focused on other bugs, pathogens, and realizing how dangerous they can be, catching them, harboring them, holding them hostage, these little pathogens. And what pathogens am I talking about? Viruses and bacteria. And they were realizing that they may be able to use these bugs, but in order to make more pathogens more bugs, because how can you use them if you can't keep on recreating them? The private industry needed to figure out how to grow them. It's like anything you grow. It's like, if you want to grow something, you just got to learn how to grow it, right? You want to grow a garden. You want to grow some tomato plants. You want to grow more tomatoes. Got to figure out how to do it. Well, they had to figure out how to farm these bugs. So it was bug farming. And even then, they knew viruses and bacteria needed something to sustain itself, needed a food. You know how, like, you're hungry? Are you hungry right now? And we need food to sustain ourselves. Well, they knew something with these bugs, that they needed something like we needed something. Because they were like, well, bugs need something. Well, we need something. Everybody needs something. The private industry also knew that all viruses and bacteria were alive. The details matter here. The private industry knew viruses and bacteria were alive. Not the public one. Because everybody has been told all these years. And now the viruses are not really alive. And all viruses and bacteria don't eat food. They just don't eat. That's what we're told too all these years. Like, why would a virus or bacteria actually eat? Like, nom, 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 nom. like why would it eat? And Spirit of Compassion has been the only source saying for decades now that bugs eat to stay alive because 
The truth is, the private industry has always known this. You have to understand something. Everything you know about science and research in health is controlled, or they only let certain information out of the gate. There's so much classified, classified research in science. See the difference? All the medical information and research in science in the health industry, both conventional and alternative even today, is controlled. And someone doesn't want you to know that bugs like viruses and bacteria eat food to stay alive because someone's going to get in trouble down the road if that just keeps on going and going. Yes, they are alive, and yes, they eat. So the industry needed to find a food, like, we need a food. How are we going to keep these bugs alive? What are we going to do? They need a fuel source, something that bugs would feed on, pathogens would feed on. The goal was to keep bugs alive outside of the human body and allow them to grow in the lab, farm them. You know, like farm-raised fish? You got them wild in the ocean, you know, like wild-caught fish, wild fish, right? And you got them wild in the streams, but they farm the fish, so they farm the salmon. You know, how do you farm them and keep them growing and then just feed them and find a food they like? Well, the industry needed a perfect environment and tried everything. They tried sugar to feed bugs and pathogens, and guess what? It didn't work. Because viruses and bacteria don't eat sugar. They found sugar did the opposite. How weird is that? Sugar inhibited the growth of these pathogens. They couldn't go anywhere or develop or proliferate with sugar. So then the industry tried various animal products. They tried meat. Think about that one for a second. Did that work? See, that wasn't the winning ticket either. It didn't work animal meat would not feed the bugs because I'm sure some of you plant basers out there are like, yeah, that's what's doing it probably. That's what's doing it. You know, they systematically went through every food and stumbled across just one. How weird is this? Just one. What they learned was that when they examined an egg, a fresh egg, they noticed that on the outside of the shell, bacteria was capable of living. The bacteria could live and survive on the outside of an egg. You ever hear of like salmonella being on like the outside of eggs, you know, over the years? Like, whoa, there's a recall from 10 farms out there and we need all the eggs all destroyed that are in the grocery stores because there's a salmonella outbreak and it's on the eggs. It's on the eggshells. Like, well, why is the salmonella still alive? Why? Is it still alive? The eggs, well, it's been days and days and days later. They've been packed. They've been shipped. They've been on trucks, tractor trailers. They've been on highways for three straight days. Then they get into a store. They're not even packed out yet. They're sitting in the back of the the you know fr- the refrigerator section of the grocery store. And then a produce manager or a dairy manager comes out. It's like, okay, let's get these eggs on the shelf. This is like 10 days later. How is salmonella capable of of living on that egg all this time later. But check this out, okay? I talked to an egg farmer, and he said, well, the process is kind of like this, Anthony. You got to collect the eggs. They got to go in the cartons. They got to get on a truck. They got to be at a waiting area, a transition place, a station. Then they're back on another truck. Then they're driving across the country. Then they get to the store, And now they're in the cold section of the store in the back, in the warehouse of the store. And then all the egg farmers have to call all the stores and yell at them and say, can you hurry up and get the eggs on the shelf? And then all the stores say, we haven't sold our other eggs yet, and it's still in the shelf life date. The freshness date is still good, and we want to sell those out. And the farms are like, wait a minute here, just hurry up and get them out. And so now it's another week in the back of the store. And then finally, when they sell all the eggs, they get the other eggs out. They put them on the shelf. We're talking two weeks. Sometimes we're talking three weeks. So egg farmers, they actually have to put a longer shelf life date on the carton. 
And then here's the funny part. Then you go to the store. Ah, no, no. Ooh, I like these eggs. Ooh, I like these eggs too. Let me get those. Okay, I'm at the checkout. I'm getting my eggs. Let me go home, putting them in the fridge. They're nice and fresh. There's a good date on them. But you don't eat them that day. Not all of them. Sometimes people leave eggs in the fridge. They're like there in the fridge for like a week. That's another week. And maybe even more. And guess what? When there's a salmonella breakout, they're like, throw out your eggs. Everybody throw out your eggs. Meanwhile, those eggs are already a month away from when they were hatched. I mean, laid. You guys know what I mean. So now before this discovery that bacteria can stay alive on the outside of an egg, they kept bugs alive in human blood. Now, this private industry many, many years ago, they tried animal blood and noticed pathogens, bugs, could not live or thrive long-term, viruses and bacteria. They couldn't proliferate or colonize in animal blood easy. Now, remember, animal blood on its own, I'm talking about, human blood on its own, not inside the host. They found human blood was the only blood that would sustain these bugs and keep the pathogens alive enough. So they kept these early pathogens alive using human blood, keeping the temperature adequate. So it's like, let's get a patient in here. Let's steal some blood. Let's keep that blood in the refrigerator. Let's make sure we take some out. Then let's keep the temperature adequate. Let's keep the bugs in there. Let's see how long they can live. Let's, an, let's analyze them. Let's see if we can keep them growing enough to stay alive, but they won't proliferate. And they were in this jam. Like, how are we going to farm this stuff? Like, how are we going to make these pathogens live longer? And isn't that funny? Because shouldn't you want pathogens not to live? Like, hmm, we got a plague right now, right? Do we want that virus that's going around right now scaring everybody? Do we want it to live? Like, do we want all these bugs to live? Well, that's the deal. This private industry was about growing and farming bugs. And it's going to take us to some other talk later. But because they realized humans had a percentage of something inside their blood already that was keeping these bugs at least in a hypnotic state. So what was that? A percentage of mercury. People, patients, had a percentage of mercury inside their blood. And that mercury was keeping the bugs in this hypnotic living state so they can analyze them, study them, try to keep them alive, preserve them, sustain them. Mercury was used in almost every aspect of medicine back in the 1920s and a little bit before that too. They wanted more. They wanted more bugs. They needed them to thrive. They needed them to grow and colonize. And mercury was preserving them and keeping them alive and sustaining them in that hypnotic state and even partially feeding them, but it wasn't enough. And they didn't know how, like, how can we grow more bugs until one patient's blood not only kept the bugs alive, it exploded them. It exploded them. They noticed quick colonizations. They were able to watch viruses reproduce rapidly. They were able to analyze pathogens, recreating themselves in large numbers. Oh, my God. It was that kind of moment. They're like, what was in this person's blood? What was in it that did this? So they analyzed what the patient was eating. So, sir, um, we got to talk to you about what you're eating and what you're eating and stuff. Why? Well, we just need that information. We need to know. Well, okay, here's my diet. I eat eggs in the morning and um, I eat eggs for lunch in the afternoon and I eat eggs for dinner. And before I go to bed, I eat another egg. <laughs> and they noticed that this patient, their diet was 95% eggs. And this patient had a lot of their own chicken coops. So a lot of chicken shacks on their property. And they ate eggs. And this is right around the 1920s, early 1920s. So 
they were like, wait a minute here. So they noticed when another patient's blood wasn't allowing pathogens to survive at all, their diet comprised of no eggs. So now they're like, okay, we got something here. This patient eats no eggs. Their blood isn't helping at all. Like the pathogens are just staying hypnotic with the mercury for a little while inside the blood, but then they just die off eventually. But this guy's blood is allowing pathogens to thrive right in front of them as if it was a magical, magical experience, like a miracle was happening. And that's what they noticed. So, but there was the potential for mild growth if someone ate some eggs. So then they brought people in. We're like, listen, we want you to eat eggs for breakfast only every day, seven days a week. And let's take your blood. So then they take their blood and they noticed the pathogens were alive and doing a little bit better and even growing a little bit. So then they would tell a patient, well, we want you to eat eggs for morning and eggs for afternoon, but don't eat them for dinner. And they took blood and they noticed the pathogens were colonizing even more. And then they went back to that other guy and they said, we need some more blood. And that guy was like, sure. And they noticed, oh my God, this is exploding. So then they requested all their patients to be eating eggs three times a day. And they were even more than that. They'd say, eat them as much as you like. Can you imagine? Some patients were like, I'm getting sick of eggs. <laughs> Here. I'm getting sick of eggs right here. They said, well, you can eat some other things in between. You could still eat some other foods, but eat eggs three times a day. And the goal was two eggs three times a day. That was the amount they wanted. Now, this is interesting because a lot of people, they would eat two eggs three times a day, but some people would eat less eggs, some people eat a little more, but what they noticed out of everything, that no matter what, if eggs were a big part of the person's diet, the bugs would grow quicker no matter what. So this led to the discovery of a food that was going to change history in chronic illness. You're probably thinking, wait, in a good way or a bad way? Well, let's just say, hang in there because you're going to know, and we're going to talk about it. Instead of using a patient's blood, they went for the egg itself. And that's when they realized that when they took a virus or bacteria that was in a patient's blood and now placed it on the outside of an eggshell, the virus and bacteria was able to survive. They started connecting the dots. So what's the next phase? What is it? It was to cut the top of the egg off, the eggshell, and cut the top of an eggshell that was fresh from a fresh egg, keep the temperature of the egg at the right level, and then insert the bacteria and viruses into the egg. And of course, add a little nutmeg and cinnamon. Actually, no. <laughs> add a tiny bit of mercury. What else would the medical industry be adding? <laughs> and that's what they did. They put a little bit of mercury inside the egg with the virus and bacteria. It's a brilliant, brilliant discovery and, and scheme. And then what would happen? They reproduced and colonized rapidly. Viruses, bacteria, the farm raising happened. Boom, they got it. Does this remind you guys of something? Why are we told to not leave that egg salad with the mayo unrefrigerated in the sun too long at a picnic or a party, right? Like, why are we told? Well, because bacteria will find it and colonize on the eggs and in the mayo, which contains eggs in the egg salad, and then food poisoning commences. Here we come. So let me spell this out for you. The classified industry took your favorite food, used it in labs to breed viruses and bacteria, farming, farm raising them, creating many different strains and mutations that weren't out yet in human nature. And somehow, somehow, these pathogens got out of the labs and into people. 
I don't know how that happened. Um, hmm. That they just walked out of the lab. You know, the viruses just got off the, they got out of the pre- petri dish. They got out of the egg. They crawled out and they just walked on out. Hey, I'm putting on my shoes, got my coat, got my umbrella. We're all heading out of the labs. Yeah, how did they get out? Okay. And this led to the early explosion of chronic illness in the 1940s and 1950s when women were filing in to their doctor's offices with symptoms never seen before in our history. By 1950, this was happening. What does this have to do with you? Who cares? This is boring. Who cares? It's why you're sick now. You got a symptom? It's why you're sick now. You got eczema? It's why you're sick. What does this have to do with your acne? A lot. That miserable acne that people have where they're so upset and they're so, I mean, traumatized by it. And it can really affect somebody's life on a deep level, emotionally, mentally, physically. And that acne wouldn't be there if it wasn't for this. This is why you have struggled with acne. This is the classified private industry's fault going all the way back. It's why you're suffering today. It's why your bloating is happening because of this. It's why your endometriosis is happening, your body pain, your fatigue, and every other condition you can think of. Everything. Now, hmm, get ready for this one. The industry wanted us sick. The bugs just didn't walk on out. No, they needed us sick. It was important. They created illnesses by using bugs. Now, the public industry, public medical industry, public research and science, public industries of all, they don't know this. People work for them. Everything's happy, good. You go to the office, whatever. You go to the lab. They don't know this is going on. They didn't know that this is where it started. This is the classified stuff going all the way back. You're not supposed to know this. So that's what fed the industry. It kept them fat and happy. People being sick was the bread and butter and bacon. And we were fried in a pan. And our favorite food, the egg, an old survival food that helped keep us alive during hard times was used against us, was used against you, was used against your children, was used against everybody you know. And it's still being used against us unknowingly today. We eat the egg, we feed our bugs, we eventually get sick. If we collect more bugs, we feed those bugs and we get sicker. The industry keeps on raising bugs, new ones and old ones. They catalog them secretly, classifying them. They categorize them in different strains, different categories, different mutations, and then they feed them eggs while they're doing it. They feed them eggs while they're doing it, and then they let them out of the gate, meaning they release them to the public. Mm-hmm, they do. And we get more bugs because of it. And then we eat eggs, and we keep the bugs alive. And then we get sicker. And if you are lucky and you're someone with very few bugs or not the aggressive strains or aggressive mutations, you can eat a lot of eggs and get away with it for quite a while, especially if you're eating other good foods or taking care of yourself, you can kind of keep that balance. But if you're somebody with Lyme disease, neurological Lyme, brain fog, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, do you have that? Eczema, psoriasis, endometriosis, fibroids, cysts, lupus, MS, eye floaters. Are you somebody with eye floaters? So many people have so many different kinds of eye floaters, right? Eczema, psoriasis, I said that before, vitiligo, depression, crippling anxiety. So many people are suffering from just debilitating anxiety, body pain, neck pain, back pain, fibromyalgia, burning skin, tingles and numbness, hives. How many people have hives out there? Mystery rashes, dermatitis, scleroderma, 
rosacea, Crohn's colitis, cold sores. Yeah, cold sores. Hmm. Guess where those cold sores came from? They were raised in eggs going all the way back 100 years, and they were let out of the gate. So your misery with cold sores, which is herpes simplex 1, lives on and lives on. And then we pass it on to somebody else, and it lives on. They did this, and they used the egg to do it. It was the only way it could be done. And then there's SIBO and celiac, migraines, or any autoimmune condition. You want to avoid eggs if you have any of these symptoms or conditions. You might be saying to yourself, I don't eat eggs, or I don't eat many of them. First of all, you probably eat more eggs than you realize throughout your life. Did you ever eat mayonnaise? or Thousand Island dressing, or animal-style fries, or animal-style burgers, pastries, cakes, cookies, donuts, many different breads or rolls? Did you ever eat pasta and pizza crust? Did you ever have cookie dough? There are so many foods that have egg in it, and you might be someone that's like, well, I haven't had a food with egg in it in a long time, but it sits inside the liver for a lifetime residue unless you cleanse it out. And if you got bugs, it'll feed off that residue and the bugs will have a field day. So enough anyway to feed these symptoms and conditions even when you're off eggs for a while. Let's talk about this. What the industry did by raising pathogens on your favorite food so that when you eat an egg and gradually worsen your condition without realizing it is despicable. And it happens to everybody. And you eventually get something, no matter what. Everybody gets something. Thyroid symptoms at age 40, migraines, headaches, weight gain. It, the list goes on. And fatigue, hot flashes, body pain, eczema, or other skin conditions, like I said, acne. Now, why would eggs play a role because these conditions are caused by viruses like Epstein-Barr and shingles. It's medical medium information that I brought out there all through these years and doctors are learning about it every day and they're helping their patients. So herpes simplex, which is cold sores, the fever blister, okay? Herpes simplex 1, 2, HHV 6, HHV 7, undiscovered HHV 10 through 16, right? Epstein-Barr and over 60 varieties of Epstein-Barr and mutations. Shingles, over 30 varieties of shingles and mutations. Streptococcus bacteria, which has hundreds of strains undiscovered and over 50 different groups that's undiscovered that were raised in the labs by the industry. So what's in an egg that these bugs like to eat? Let's go there next, all right? Protein and enzymes. But hey, Protein, that's why you're eating eggs. Yay, that's the whole point. And enzymes can't be bad, right? The protein in an egg is attached to enzymes that viruses can easily absorb through their membrane because the proteins are not mature. They are in their development phase. So the enzymes are attached to the protein, a unique process that only happens in an egg. There are a large amount of enzymes in a chicken egg because the chick has not formed yet. So the proteins are unstable and the enzymes help keep the protein stabilized. Also, the bugs feed off of hormones, natural occurring hormones in the egg itself. So if you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, I'm safe. I could do my organic egg or I can do my backyard raised eggs, but no, the egg is a unique ball of hormones. All eggs, even organic eggs are. So hmm, what happens when you eat an egg? Let's go into that next. How is it going to feed a virus? Like how's that even gonna happen or a bacteria inside of you? You chew the egg, yum, yum, yum. You swallow it, it enters your small intestinal tract. If there's some H. pylori in there, right? That H. pylori is gonna have a field day it's going to have a picnic. It's going to have a nice brunch. If there's some streptococcus in there, you're thinking, I don't have strep. What's he even talking about? This is ridiculous. Uh, SIBO, hmm, that's streptococcus, um, UTIs, bladder infections. 
yeast infections, kidney infections, chronic sinusitis, um, styes. Let's see, the list goes on. Yeah, people have streptococcus all in their system. Did you have strep throat a long time ago? Because it's still in us. If you have a little bit of strep in your gut, because everybody does, you can be somebody with a small amount of bugs. So it's a small feeding frenzy that goes on inside your gut and or inside your liver or inside your bloodstream or anywhere else eventually when the egg travels. But you can be somebody, though, with a large feeding frenzy going on inside of you and you have a lot of symptoms and there's a lot going on with your health. And the bugs get little bits of the egg. The bacteria absorbs the egg through its membrane, the outer membrane that protects the bacteria. Over time, you start getting some bloating or digestive issues down the road, and you land yourself a SIBO diagnosis, which most women are getting at this point in time. And a lot of men, a lot of men are getting that SIBO diagnosis. As the egg travels through your intestinal tract, the egg is pretty much like a gluey goo. Now, it's being absorbed through the intestinal tract up into the hepatic portal vein, heading to the liver. So now the egg's traveling up to the liver. Inside everyone's liver are where most of the bugs are at, plus toxins, petrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, toxic heavy metals, mercury, lead, aluminum, cadmium, copper. Just the list goes on. The list goes on. Okay? But there's bugs in there. Because bugs like being in there too. Because remember what I was telling you before? Mercury feeds bugs just enough. Well, the private industry, the classified part, figured that out long ago. So our liver has that too in there. So bugs like to be in there. They love that spot. But that spot, egg gets in there too. And that's where it's like more fun. The egg's coming up into the liver. Here it comes. And some people have more eggs going on inside the liver building up. Some people have more things in the liver. But here's the thing. Some people have more bugs inside their liver. That's where it gets a little sketchy. Like one Epstein-Barr, two Epstein-Barr, three Epstein-Barr. Like one potato, two potato, three potato. They'll have all kinds of different bugs in there. They'll have a simplex in there. If they've ever had a cold sore in their life, well, that simplex lives in the liver. If they ever had shingles or... Maybe they have shingles and don't know it because they have back pain or jaw pain, trigeminal neuralgia, or anything else going on. But the point is, these bugs are in the liver, and that's where the party happens. That's the camp out. That's the campground. That's the fair. That's the county fair. It's happening in the liver with all these bugs. Somebody will have a couple of different varieties of bugs, a couple of other different varieties of bugs. And some people just might have one or two, and they haven't really done much yet. But as the immune system drops over time, you're under stress, your adrenaline's pumping, life isn't easy, you're not eating good, you're eating more eggs than other foods, some other things are happening, then that bug can grow and take advantage of that egg inside the liver. And they love the liver because that's where most of the food is. So as the eggs enter the liver, another feeding frenzy occurs, that gooey glue trails up to that liver, okay? And the viruses, they don't have a mouth, so they're not eating like, they're not sitting down at a dinner table and they got a fork and a knife and they're just eating their food like that. I know, so you know, or they're not like an insect, an insect that's eating somehow or drinking some kind of water off of a leaf, you know, somewhere. That's not it at all. Viruses absorb trace particles of the egg through their membranes. And this is how science and research get the best of us. They even get the best of the smartest people out there in health. Because we think about, well, viruses must have a mouth. They must chew. They must eat. That can't happen. It's impossible. So viruses don't eat. Science and research knows that they can dumb us down by saying, Viruses don't eat, you know, because they can keep us like that. Because in our minds, in people's minds, because I talk to people all the time, I talk to doctors and they're like, viruses eat. They're like, what do they have a mouth? They don't have a mouth. They don't start chewing their food. I've heard that from doctors. And I'm not talking about inexperienced doctors either. I'm talking about 
renowned experts in their field, like the real thing, like 30 years experience, 40 years experience, seeing all kinds of people, droves coming into their offices for years. They've studied in all different fields of medicine, and they can easily get tricked by this one because human nature is to think that if something eats, it's got to eat, chomp, chomp, chomp. It's got to like eat something. And that's where they get us in their grips, the industry, because we just instantly think an animal or an insect has a mouth and just eats. And so what we need to know something about this is that viruses and bacteria not only eat, but they eliminate poison. So they excrete poison because what goes in has to come out. It's like anybody that eats really, right? But viruses and pathogens absorb the food through their membrane and then release poisons and toxins through the membrane out. So that's how it's done. And this waste matter is highly toxic. It builds up in the liver over time, makes your liver stagnant, sluggish, And then you get the heart palpitations, you get the weight starts coming on, the hot flashes, the night sweats, you get a little bit of energy loss, digestion system doesn't work good anymore, all these different things happen. The viruses feed off of the goo that's sitting inside the liver over time. And then you're like, wait a minute, I exercise, I take care of myself, and wait, I got this pound on me this extra pound. When do I have an extra pound or two? More, why is weight coming on easier now? Like, it doesn't make sense. Is it because I'm aging? Is it because I'm getting older and the pounds are coming on? It makes somebody gain weight to people who feel like they would never gain a pound ever in their life. And they start gaining weight. And some people gain that weight so early in life, in their 20s and teens, and it just happens. Because the liver gets maxed out easy and it gets filled up with all these toxins and bugs. The very thing, viruses and bacteria, you guys know what I'm talking about. And as each year goes by in your life, in anyone's life, a new symptom or condition can develop or an old symptom can come back and go and come back. And next thing you know it, your acne's back. Next thing you know it, you have acne for the first time or eczema for the first time, or psoriasis, or like I said before, like weight is gaining now. And it's like, why is the weight coming on? And, or migraines, or floaters in the eyes, or any kind of body pain, fatigue. And that's because the bugs are starting to live their life inside of our bodies. And we're feeding these bugs as we're living our life as each year goes by. But look, 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 the process of developing symptoms and conditions depends on a lot of factors. I'm not saying eggs are the sole reason out there why everybody's sick. It is one of the sole reasons of how viruses and bacteria started and were released into the world. But there's all these other factors that allows the viruses to turn into a sickness. And eating eggs, yes, that's one of them. But there's other things too. It depends on what bug somebody has. Is it aggressive? Is it severe? It, what kind of strain is it, is it? What kind of mutation is it? What variety? Or how weakened somebody's immune system is. It's important to keep our immune system strong, you guys. It's so important. I talk about that for over 35 years. But we weaken our immune systems because life is not easy here. And it can happen to any of us at any time. We go through emotional struggles. That's a trigger. We go through hardships. We get exposed to pesticides and toxic heavy metals and herbicides and all kinds of other things too. But it all depends on how many good things you're doing for yourself. What tools are you using for yourself? For example, are you doing the celery juice? Because That's a tool to help clean up the mess, to help clean up the liver, get bugs out because the celery juice helps to kill off bugs by destroying the membrane that they use to even eat foods they like, like eggs. See? So while bugs are making mess inside of you, all kinds of messes, 
you're working on cleaning up the mess too at the same time. So what tools are you using? And then it falls into this whole thing. Check this out, okay? Like you're doing a tool that's good for you. You're using something that's good, like celery juice, but you're still eating eggs on your avocado toast. See? And yeah, you can still get acne or maybe not acne as bad because your celery juice is keeping things at bay. So you can do things that are helping while you're doing things that are hurting. Look, it's not your fault that you might be doing something that's hurting. They ruined our eggs. They did. They destroyed our eggs, made them a problem. It's not like I got something against eggs and you're doing something terrible. Far from it. You're trying to eat. You're trying to survive, trying to live your life. And I'm trying to help you and trying to make sure you have the info so you can protect yourself. So the industry doesn't win, you know, the darkness, the darkness that the, that's involved, the game they play. They created the bugs. They made a world of sickness. They make trillions of dollars as the years come and the centuries go by. And you don't have to be a part of that entirely. You can be like, you know what? I can keep my eggs out. But say you want to keep your eggs in. What tools are you doing? Are you doing some celery juice? Are you eating good overall? Are you bringing in herbs, wild foods? Are you building up your immune system? Do you know how to take care of yourself? Cleanse the liver? Everything matters. But acne can sneak up on anybody when you're still doing things that can feed the bugs, like eating the eggs. This reminds me of cocaine, like the binging out that happened, well, it happens today. <laughs> People are on cocaine every day, but it reminds me of the late 70s and early 80s and mid 80s. There was this trend and and I've talked to a doctor about this, and he was talking to me about it. He said, you know what's funny? He goes, this trend was crazy back then. It was like happening. He had patients come into the office that were cocaine addicts. And um, so what happened was people were snorting cocaine for three days straight. They didn't eat anything. They didn't drink anything like they do now. But they weren't taking care of themselves, of course. You just go on a binge, and you just stay awake. You don't sleep a wink. And you just do it for three days until you crash and you burn out. You sleep and then you wake up and then you look around and you head to the health food store or to some store that sells a bottle of vitamin C. Doesn't matter, junkiest stuff on the planet, just a bottle of vitamin C and you down it. And this trend was so you can do more cocaine. It was like you're doing something good for yourself for a moment so you can get back on the game, the cocaine game. So another three days, you binge on cocaine. You don't sleep a wink. You don't drink. You don't eat anything. You don't take care of yourself. You're just lost somewhere doing it. You crash, you burn, you go to sleep, you wake up. You're like, what? And then you're back at the store for more vitamin C. That's what it was. That's what it was about. Sound familiar? You're eating pretty good, no processed foods. You're exercising, no gluten. You're staying hydrated, drinking more water. And you have a cheat day <laughs> or a binge weekend and you're eating whatever. And now comes Monday, you're trying to work it out in the gym. You're doing extra exercises. You're drinking lots of water. You're trying to flush your system. You're trying to look into some kind of neat little trendy cleanse out there. And you're gluten-free for a little bit longer. You're staying away from the chocolate cake or some kind of cake. And then you do it again and you have your cheat weekend again, right? But here's the difference with eggs. You don't know it's a problem. You have no idea. Nobody's going to tell you. It's classified information. You're hearing it for the first time in your life here on this podcast or unless you read the medical medium books. So that's the difference. What is the difference? It's stealth. It's classified. It's there to mess your life up. And you don't know it's bad. So you're eating the eggs. You got the whole foods. You got the eggs. You got this good diet going on. You got your egg on the avocado toast. 
you got your egg, your scrambled eggs in the morning without your toast because you don't want then the carbs. So you're just doing plain old straight scrambled eggs with maybe a vegetable or an omelet, right? And you don't know it that the eggs are bad because the classified industry ruined them on you and no one told you. And then you don't even get a choice like the cocaine addict does because the cocaine addict knows that cocaine is bad for them. They know it. They're not like, oh, this stuff is so good for me. Let me snort another line. Like, this stuff is so good for me. No, they know it's bad. They're just stuck in the addiction, right? But they get at least a chance when they wake up out of that addiction for a second to take care of themselves a little bit, like maybe take some vitamin C. But you don't get that chance. So you can't even counter your egg addiction that nobody told you was a problem. So you don't even get the choice unless you counter it by accident like you're doing your celery juice as a tool or you're eating good in other ways or you're taking care of yourself or you're getting a lot of sleep like whatever it is you're countering it and you're countering it by accident but you know the scoop now eaters lose all that's a scoop a classified industry took your egg used it raised all these pathogens, created a world of sickness, pain, and suffering with your egg, okay? Now, you know, like millions of other people know, the truth from medical medium information, that eggs are a problem now. Now you have the choice to do what a cocaine addict does, take vitamin C in between binging, but your choice is like, hey, I can actually do some more celery juice, take care of myself better if I really want to keep my eggs around. At least you have a choice. But as time goes by and the eggs build up inside the liver and we have different relationships, we spread more bugs around, pass more bugs around, we go into restaurants. I've had people tell me that they find Band-Aids in their salads in some of the finest restaurants because chefs cut their fingers People who are working in the industry cut their fingers. They got Band-Aids on. And we collect more bugs. We collect them from public bathrooms. We collect them from all kinds of different ways. So as time goes on, the scale tips. And it's not about juggling it anymore. The scale tips. All of a sudden, the bad outweighs the good. It's not 50-50, kind of ebbing and flowing, where you're getting a symptom here or a symptom there. Or you're feeling pretty good and all's well, but you're kind of doing some good things for yourself. You're gluten-free. You might drink some celery juice. You might try something else. And no processed foods. You're eating a few other good foods. You're taking care of yourself, getting more sleep. But the scale tips. We collect all these new bugs. We live our life. We get more toxic. Our liver gets filled up with more poisons and toxins. We collect more toxic heavy metals. And then, boom. Someone breaks up with us. Betrayal. Our adrenals are running. We're in fight or flight. Our immune system's lowering. We have some kind of relationship breakup or a divorce. Somebody cheats on us or broken trust. And that's there. And the scale is tipping and the eggs are still in there. They're still there. And as more and more cheat days happen, you can't kind of have your cheat days anymore. Like, that's not an option. You need to do more because as you're going through life, the scale is so tipped, you're starting to get a little bit of eczema now, more bloating. Maybe your reproductive system isn't functioning quite like it should and you get a cyst for the first time in your life. Maybe hypothyroid. Maybe that happens and the scale gets tipped too far. But if the eggs are still there, you have a choice. You can take them out. You can get rid of them and at least levy the playing field again, bring in some more tools. And you guys get the tools from the medical medium info. So you can deal with your heart palps, your fatigue, your anxiety and depression and your hair falling out and the bloating and the thyroid problems. But what if, what if here's somebody else? the millions of people out there that don't have these tools and even know that the egg is not a good thing and it's not helping them. They just start their doctor journey. It's 
it's always good to have a doctor, of course. And you have to have those doctors. And there are a lot of doctors now using medical medium information. And they, they'll even say, we're a medical medium friendly clinic. We're a medical medium friendly doctor offices. But the doctor journey is the thing that then millions of people go on. They look for answers, just like the millions of people that have done it before them over the last 70 years or more that got in trouble with their health because the classified private industry created the world of chronic illness and sickness, and it's been a mess ever since. So you're on this doctor shopping journey. You're looking doctor to doctor. You go to one doctor. Now you're at a specialist. Now you're at a neurologist. Now you're at a pulmonologist. And you go to one doctor, and he looks at you. He gives you a label for your condition, whatever that name is, but doesn't know why you're sick. He runs a bunch of tests, asks what you're eating, tells you to eat eggs. You go to your nutritionist. Your nutritionist doesn't know why you're sick, does a diet analysis, probably tells you never to cleanse, tells you that your body cleanses on its own or something like that, and then tells you to eat eggs. You go to your chiropractor, and your chiropractor doesn't know why you're sick, but they want to help with your diet too, something they never did in the past. That's something that developed in the last 20 years, and they'll tell you to go eat eggs. You go to your acupuncturist. Your acupuncturist doesn't know what's wrong with you, doesn't know why you're sick with this chronic illness, and doesn't know why you're suffering from all these different symptoms, but they'll tell you to eat eggs. You talk to your health coach, your trainer. They don't know what's wrong with you, but they'll tell you to go eat eggs as well and get plenty of protein. And whether you're sick or you're not sick at all, whether you're somebody who's just partially sick or you're not sick yet, you get told to eat eggs. Look, check this out, okay? Public science and research, medical science and research, doesn't know why anybody's sick yet. Why do you think the theory of autoimmune is out there where they tell you your body's attacking itself, which isn't true, it's a theory, was never proven? And why do you think they say autoimmune is also cause unknown? Because science and research in the public arena doesn't know why anyone's sick, all right? But classified private industry that started the sickness, the epidemic of the world sicknesses we got today, they know why you're sick. The private classified industry, they know why you're sick. They started the whole mess. They're the reason why the epidemic of chronic illness exists today. They're the ones that created it. But what's crazy is the public science of research and medical science of research, all the experts and so forth, they don't know why anybody's sick. They don't know why someone has eczema or lupus or what causes it. And we can play that game all day long. I think you get the picture, though. And a label is not the cause. That's just to shut you up. They still don't know why you're sick. Like with eczema, it's like, here's a cream. Good luck. See you later. That's what they'll say, right? And with everybody being such experts, like the public science of research and medical science of research, all the medical communities, everybody thinking they're literally an expert in health, science, research, studies, all of it. And what do they do when you get sick? They tell you to eat eggs. What about egg whites or home-raised chicken eggs? Can you do those? You know, I got a friend who has a chicken shed and she lets out all the chickens and she tells me it's really healing and therapeutic. They just go all squawking. They go out, they're pecking. They're all out and about. They're all over her yard. She has a little fence going around the yard. And she tells me, Anthony, they're eating insects. They're eating seeds. They're eating bugs. They're eating grass. They're eating leaves. <laughs> and she tells me all this stuff. And then she'll throw her scraps that she has, you know, her vegetable scraps, and she'll and her fruit scraps, and she'll throw them out there, and the chickens are all pecking through it. She says it's the best thing ever. But she's got neurological Lyme, and she finally gave in. She was like, you know what? I finally gave in. I got the neurological Lyme. I contacted you, and you told me to get off the eggs. And it broke her heart. 
Her heart was just broken from that. It took a while to get past it. Now she just collects all the eggs, which is still therapeutic, and she gives them to her neighbor who has neurological Lyme. But she gives them to her neighbor because her neighbor said she's not going to ever quit eggs. She loves them, and she's not going to give it up no matter what kind of Lyme disease symptoms she's suffering from. So she brings them over to her neighbor because her neighbor's going to buy eggs anyway, and these are the best eggs. Because they've ruined our eggs, it doesn't matter if they're organic or free-range or homegrown or from the best place on the planet. That was taken away from us no matter what. That's the hard part about all of this because the eggs will still feed the bugs in our bodies that create all of our sicknesses. And I get it. You might be somebody that's like, you know what? I don't have bugs. I just got to like, something's a little off, like my microbiome or maybe my adrenals or hormones are off or my digestion is off or I'm allergic to gluten or something. And I got a great practitioner or a doctor and they're just telling me these things. I get it. If you're in that place in life, I totally respect that. And But what happens, though, when you've seen your 10th doctor and you're losing the quality of your life and the fatigue is so bad and your skin disorder is so hard on you and everything else, then you just get to a point in your life after five years of this or 10 years of this or maybe just a year of this where it's like, okay, what's wrong? I need an answer because I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> I've, I've been around. I'm seasoned. What is the answer? And then, then it's like, what? Okay, wait a minute. Pathogens? Okay, toxic heavy metals? And what are the triggers? Because with people, you can go down the road like everybody else and symptoms may come later. You could be somebody that's exercising and you're not sick right now and all seems to be okay. And then a divorce, it's a crash. And then your immune system crashes. Your adrenals are fl flooding or a bad breakup, or you get cheated on, or a betrayal, or a loss of a loved one, or even childbirth, that can lower the immune system. I've talked about that before. It's why so many moms get Hashimoto's thyroiditis three months after they deliver a baby, or they give birth, and all these things can happen. So Heartache alone, getting stabbed in the back is devastating, surges that adrenaline, lowers the immune system, and the problem can develop months down the road. And then there's other levels of stress too, like a lot of levels of stress that we deal with, and bugs can take advantage of that when the immune system drops. It's like when a woman gives birth, her immune system is protecting the baby, not the mom, the baby. And so because of that, her immune system, 50% of it during her pregnancy has been taking care of the child. The other 50% is taking care of her. But things can happen because of that. And then childbirth itself, it's over 90% of the immune system is taking care of the baby to protect the child. And that's why if a mom has something going on, then all of a sudden the fatigue happens, the hair loss happens, um, anything can happen after childbirth. It's, it's well known. Women develop a lot of symptoms that reoccur later, including severe depression, anxiety. But what's not known is why all these symptoms happened after childbirth and months later after childbirth. Research and science doesn't know why any of that happened and what the causes are. And because, and they don't know also about the immune system dropping during pregnancy and when giving birth. And that every little bit counts for support with the immune system when you're pregnant and after giving birth. But they don't know that part. So then it becomes a mystery. It's like, okay, your thyroid problems, your hypothyroidism, your hair falling out, your migraines, your aches and pains, your fatigue, and all of it. We don't know why it's happening. You just got autoimmune or maybe it's genetic, maybe it's genes and they just start going down that road and, but they don't know also what to do to protect you. Instead, it'll be the opposite and they'll say, well, you need to rebuild after that pregnancy. You need to rebuild after giving birth. You should be eating lots of eggs. So keep the eggs in there and that's recommended to every pregnant woman who's either pregnant or after they give birth. It's the first thing that every health professional does. 
or the second thing or the third thing is what are you eating? Are you eating your eggs? So, and at the same time, the immune system's dropping, the eggs are feeding more bugs. Nobody knows that's why all of a sudden someone has chronic fatigue syndrome. And then we're back to this whole thing of nobody knowing. And it's really sad. Look, I understand if someone can't let go of their eggs. It's a survival food for a lot of people now. I got people, friends, that'd be like, look, you can help me with anything. Don't touch my eggs. Don't go near them. It's my lifeblood. It's my religion. Don't touch it. Like I've heard that by from friends. I've heard that from even professionals that have reached out, doctors that reach out for help. And they're like, why am I sick, AW? And they'll be like, look, I want you to do this, do this, do this, and then eggs. And they're like, what? All of a sudden, eggs? And <laughs> like, no way, you can't go there. And I get it completely, you know? And try to be kind of open to somebody else too when you give this information out to them. Like when you tell them, look, stay away from eggs because you might get the same kind of flack. You might get hit with the same kind of stuff. Keep a mind, you know, keep your mind open and also be cautious, like tread carefully because you wouldn't believe the kind of trouble I get about the egg thing. And it wasn't even my fault. I didn't ruin the eggs. The industry did. You guys know. You know what's funny? You know what's funny? If no one knows why you're sick, then how does anyone know eggs are actually good for you? If no one knows how to keep us from getting sick, then why are eggs so good for us? There's all these anti-aging people out there. They're like, anti-aging, live longer, but they make sure that you're on this balanced diet and you got your eggs in that diet too. But the eggs aren't going to keep you living longer when you got all these bugs making you sicker and giving you diseases and conditions, including cancer and all kinds of other things. So it's not one of those longevity foods. So let's talk about science, the science end of things, right? In your mind, you might be somebody that's like, well, what about the evidence that eggs are really healthy for us? Okay, what about that? Well, it's funny because paid for science, talking about eggs being that good for us, doesn't know why anybody's sick. That's incredible, right? Or how about this? Paid for science and studies, not only doesn't know why anybody's sick, but doesn't know classified private evil industry from the past ruined the eggs, raised all the bugs that made us sick. So here they are talking about protein source, number one protein source. There's nothing wrong with eggs at all. They're the perfect food. That's the consensus. They got the omega-3s. They got vitamins. They got nutrients. And that's what they'll do. And it's all paid for studies, which you won't find. You won't find a paid-for study or a bunch of paid-for studies that actually talk about why eggs are really not good for you. And here's the other problem. Nobody knows in science land, science research land or medical science research land in public arena, not classified, public arena knows that those eggs will feed bugs. So if that study ever happened on a public level, it would be shut down faster than you could think it would, a bomb would blow up in the place. Literally, lab coats would be flying everywhere. It would be a disaster. That's what would happen if there was an actual study where they were discovering eggs actually feed the bugs, keeping everybody sick, and this stuff got out there. Forget it. They don't want that chicken out of the chicken shed, running down the street, telling the truth about what they did to the eggs and why everybody's sick. They'll never, ever, ever tell you that your bugs that are causing your sickness were because they raised them for decades in labs and let them out. They don't want that chicken out of the shed. They don't want nobody knowing why you're sick. They just don't. And look, they'll never tell you that the eggs you eat feed the bugs they raised in labs no one will tell you it's the wild, wild west when you get sick. And that's how they love it. They love that. Not the good people working for the good science of research and for the good meaning, the good intentions, all the different health professionals that they've got their heart in it and they want to heal people. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the classified private industry that started this epidemic of illness, including 
what we're faced with today. You're on your own when you get sick. That's what happens. And if you don't think so, you'll realize that after your fourth doctor that you're on your own. And maybe you're someone that's not really sick or you got just a couple little symptoms and you're young and microbiome is an example of making you kind of like thinking, well, everything's good. Candida, I could deal with that. Um, a little bit of a hormone imbalance, digestion's off a little bit. But man, when you get sick, sick, and that eczema's getting really bad, and your fatigue's getting worse, and your brain fog's taking over, and you got these unexplainable symptoms, and you're on your third neurologist, and you did all the testing and spent all this money, and you got this neurological fatigue, your anxiety's crippling, then you want answers. And they're not going to tell you why everybody's sick. And they're just going to tell you, you should be eating your eggs. Well, of course, no processed foods. Don't do processed foods, you know, but that's not enough. That's not an answer. And guess what? Plant-based is not enough either because I know what some of you guys might be thinking that are plant-based, like, ooh, I'm off the hook. I'm off the hook, man. I don't eat eggs. But the problem is plant-basers always run back to eggs. It's the first thing they run to when they get a symptom or they have a tooth problem, cavity, or an ache and a pain, and then boom, they're done with the plant-based diet. They still keep some of, some of the tools that are in the plant-based diet, like some of the philosophy that's in a plant-based diet. They'll keep something, but they'll bring eggs in as their first food or cheese. They'll bring eggs or cheese. They'll hit the dairy. I get it. I totally get it. But being plant-based is not enough because there's also residue from years of eating eggs still inside the liver. And if you're not cleansing or learning how to cleanse that out of your liver to begin with, you can still get your first symptoms or your second symptoms or third symptoms or a new round of them while you're plant-based, unless you know why you got sick to begin with. Paleo, carnivore, that's not an answer. FODMAP, food combining, clean eating, random supplements and no processed foods are not enough and they're not answers. Medical medium information is about answers, yes, Getting rid of eggs is one of the options, one of the choices you can make that can really help. And if you've been to 10 doctors, you're still going to be told to eat eggs. Maybe your plant-based doctor might be like, no, no eggs. Plant-based is the way to go. But I've seen plant-based doctors get sick for the first time or for the third time and something doesn't feel right and they're off eating eggs. They actually go get eggs themselves. Many people on a plant-based diet start just eating eggs again, and they won't rip eggs apart too bad. It's so funny. I've noticed in the plant-based movement that eggs are coveted. They're actually coveted because you never know when you're going to need to run back to them. So when the symptoms get the best of you, the first animal product you run to is those eggs. And hey, look, that's okay. It's like you get a little scared and you're like, oh my God, maybe eggs are something I need. When the crap hits the fan, it's the first place you go. It's one of those foods in the back of your mind that you can lean on when things get uncomfortable. There's a law about eggs. You don't mess with them. It's the best food on the planet for you, hands down. That's what everybody's told. You know what's a sick joke? They raise viruses in a lab on eggs the viruses cause reproductive system diseases in women, and then you tell women to eat eggs for their health, which keeps feeding their viruses and making the reproductive system conditions worse. It's really, really evil. Look, let's face it, no one's allowed to talk bad about eggs. It hits the emotional core. It's a comfort food and considered a health food. People start putting their hard-boiled eggs over easy, poached eggs on their salads. They make egg sandwiches and burritos, avocado toast with eggs. I see it all the time. There's people out there, and they're, like, making their avocado toast, and then all of a sudden, here comes a fried egg out of nowhere, and it gets put on top. It's like, wait a minute. Wait, wait, you didn't have to do that. Oh, what? And then, or scrambled eggs. I see that, too. You got avocado toast going on, and all of a sudden, now there's a scrambled egg on top. 
And problem is with that, then the acne comes three months later or two months later and nobody knows why. It's like, wait a minute, why am I getting a new bout of acne or why am I getting acne at all? Is it hormones? No, it's the eggs. It was feeding something inside of you and you're not gonna blame the eggs ever even if you knew the truth. Sometimes people still won't go there. It's like, okay, I know the truth but there's no way I'm going there. The classified industry loves how we love our eggs. That's the first thing. They also love how we don't know what they did to our eggs. They want us to marry those eggs till death do us part. That's what they want. It's like an insurance policy to guarantee we all get sick someday. They want our bugs to be fed. Did you hear that? That was the plan. And then sell pharmaceuticals, keep people sick for also other reasons too, reasons that aren't so great. And it feeds the industry. And the industry's favorite thing of all is that not only do we not have a clue, but we treat eggs like it's the air we breathe. We never question it. It's going to go on forever and ever and ever. Did you ever see that movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers? It's an old movie from many years ago. They leave a pod by your bed that looks like a cabbage. So when you get sleepy and you're ready to go to bed, you're getting all comfy, you're tired, and then you start falling asleep, okay? Your body gets taken over by a replica of yourself. But the difference is you end up mindless. Your body was snatched and you do as they say. Well, this egg thing is kind of like that. We mindlessly eat our eggs and we shut up about them. Okay, don't say nothing bad because you'll get your grandpa upset, especially if he's making his eggs in the morning. He's going to start yelling. Trust me, he will. You'll get your mom upset too. She'll start yelling. It, look, it happened to me. I was seven years old. Spirit of Compassion said, you know, hold off those eggs. And I was like, well, I don't want to have that this morning. She was like, what? And it just went out of control. Look, you'll get your best friend upset. I got a friend who yelled at another friend and freaked out because the other friend didn't want any eggs. I mean, and, and or you'll just get this whole thing where somebody be like, what do you mean you don't like eggs? Well, everybody likes eggs. Uh, you got allergic, are you allergic to eggs? Or you got an allergy or something? People just freak out because they've all been body snatched. Even our families, they're taken over by the body snatcher pod and you're the only one left. But if you complain, and say you don't want your eggs, and you tell them that those eggs are bad for you, then they'll leave a pod by your bed, and you'll get snatched. You'll eat the eggs for the rest of your life, and you'll be eating eggs all the time. Look, I get it. No one wants to know they got bugs in them. No one wants to know that they're feeding their bugs with their favorite food. When you think about that, it's really annoying. It's like, okay, wait a minute here. That's my favorite comfort food. Or that's my favorite food, but I don't tell everybody it's my favorite food because some people will be like, I don't really like eggs. Yeah, they do. When you learn the truth about eggs that's already helped millions of people worldwide, the medical medium information, people who are so sick and they needed every advantage they could get and it counts when you're really sick and when they rid the eggs from their diet, it changed their lives. It gave them that edge. See, I get it. If you're not that sick, no one wants to know you got a bug. And no one wants to know you're feeding your bugs, especially if it's your favorite food. You'd rather think, maybe my hormones are off, or adrenals are a little bit problematic, or my gut balance is off, or poor digestion, or leaky gut, or got autoimmune or something. But if you get sick enough, and it finally hits you, something's wrong and we need to get it better. Getting rid of eggs is a good start, a really good start. They took a survival food, the innocent egg, that we relied upon, utilized, and needed for hundreds of years, and turned this food, the egg, against us without our permission, taking something precious and meaningful that was ours and weaponized it and raised the very pathogens that are responsible for sickness today without us knowing, without us seeing, 
and without us getting a chance to stand up for ourselves and make a choice to protect our egg and be able to decide for ourselves what is right. As we walk our path, we want things to be as they are, not something else that we know nothing about. There's a feeling that overcomes us all. Every time we're in a store, you remember it, right? As you're grabbing a dozen eggs or more, there's an emotional attachment as we open the carton hatch, an automatic button in us to make sure each one is perfect and not one of them is cracked. We learn this from the beginning of our life. It's part of a deep emotional connection before we're taught to scramble or fry. They took a legendary food from us, surrounded by life-saving glory. They snatched it away from us all and created a forever lasting gory, leading to sickness of millions of people. But you're not supposed to know that story. The egg was used to take the breath away of so many who did no wrong. It caused a historical neurological problem, and some ended up in the iron lung. As the innocent people stared at the mirror, they couldn't go anywhere. They were filled with terror. They no longer could look up and see the church steeple unless they were looking down at the floor in the mirror. How did this happen, and what was the way? The truth is that men in the lab coats opened the egg. Research and science turned against us overnight in just one day. What does it matter? In their eyes, it was six of one half dozen of the other, and who cared if each of the eggs they opened up were from a different hen mother? What they did to us and our eggs is surreal shows us once again that the spiritual war both around us and above us is real and that darkness runs man and the industries and tries to decide how we receive our pain and our suffering but this doesn't have to be our fate we have our own free will to take control over our health and not throw it all away because they know nothing we can make our own decisions and choices as we learn how to overcome and be them at their own game and as we battle darkness on our own terms not their terms they're not the same using the tools and the knowledge and the inside truth from way above we can see the light and decide our own outcome that can make every difference on your journey searching wellness so i leave to you a chance and a choice that can bring you to a place of empowerment and peace as you bring your health back and rise out of the ashes. See, I believe in you, and I know you can heal. As you guys know, I'm not a doctor. Any information you learned here, feel free to take to your doctor or healthcare provider. If you found this show helpful and informative, feel free to share it with someone in need of the information. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Medical Medium. And for more information on healing, please visit medicalmedium.com. Thank you so much for listening.